Hey there, everyone. Jill here in the pickle jar. In today's episode, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the symptoms I experienced when I was diagnosed with adrenal insufficiency. And I'm also going to share with you at the end of the episode, um, my personal feelings when somebody tells me that they have adrenal fatigue. And uh, so we'll get to that later, but let's start with the symptoms and a little bit first about a little history, if you don't know about my history with adrenal insufficiency and Addison's disease. So I was diagnosed when I was 35, which was on March 14th, 2011. So it's almost been 13 years. I'm 48 years old now. Um, and I was diagnosed, I did not go into an adrenal crisis. I was very fortunate. And I was diagnosed early, basically because my dad had Addison's disease. So my dad died at 56, six years before I was diagnosed of an adrenal crisis post-surgery. Um, so I lived with Addison's disease all my life. I was very kind of more, I think I had heightened awareness of what was going on in my body. So um, diagnosed at 35, but I can honestly trace the symptoms back you know, back to when I was in high school. Okay. So back almost probably, you know, probably 15, probably at least 20 years before I was diagnosed, it was very common for me in high school to always have a salt shaker with me. I put salt on lettuce. I put salt on bread. Um, and what did we kind of chalk that up to? I had low blood pressure. It was, you know what? Jill's dad had Addison's disease. He put salt on everything. She's picked up a really bad habit from her dad. Um, I was very, I was less social than my other friends. Um, everybody was out going to parties and different things like that. And I just chose not to, I just, I had no interest in it. I found it very draining, overstimulating. So I chose not to do those things. My mom would often make comments that we'd be watching a movie and, you know, getting to the good end of the movie and she'd look and I'd have disappeared. I've gone upstairs. I've gone to bed. I wanted to be in bed and sleep. It's like, I knew I needed that recovery time. And, you know, my first job was at my uncle's pizza place and I was folding pizza boxes and I did not work there very long. And I quit because I could not physically handle the heat of the pizza ovens and everything that was going on, the commotion. It was just too overstimulating. And I just knew it wasn't for me. So, um, so I quit. <laughs> um, and then, you know, when I went on to university, again, maintaining that lifestyle, high sodium, lots of rest. Nobody questioned it. I got married right out of university. Um, and if you haven't less, listened to some of the past episodes, um, I'd been married nine months and five days. I was eight weeks pregnant with my son and my husband was killed. So went through very something very traumatic and extremely stressful. When I went through that period and through the pregnancy, um, I had problems with my blood pressure. I was told to consume more salt. So I ate a lot of McDonald's. And on those McDonald's hamburgers, I would open up multiple packs of salt and put it on the hamburger. Um, I needed sugar a lot. Like I drank a lot of Sunny Delight, a lot of Coca-Cola. Um, and I was having blood pressure issues. My heart rate would go up. I saw a cardiologist. I saw a neurologist who couldn't get blood pressure readings from me. And basically it was all just chalked up to stress. Stress can do a lot of things to your body. You're going through something extremely stressful. So this is how your body's reacting to it. So um, I had my son, I got remarried, I got pregnant with my twin daughters. Um, when my daughters were six months old is when my, my father passed away. So during the pregnancy with my daughters, um, I've been told, I don't know how legitimate this is, but I've been told that because um, possibly my adrenal glands were failing during that time, that I was lucky I got pregnant with twins because their adrenal glands would have actually detected my low cortisol and would have actually been able to produce cortisol for me. So my understanding when you're developing adrenal insufficiency is that your body can go through these highs and lows. So if that's, and that's honestly what I truly believe was happening in high school, those symptoms were starting to present themselves. My body was starting to struggle. And then the brain and the adrenal glands work together through a hormone called ACTH and the brain really pushes those adrenal glands to start working. Okay. It really gives them a good kick and those adrenal glands can do it. They did amazing things with Addison's disease. You're not symptoms. Don't usually get life threatening and diagnosis often doesn't happen until your those adrenal glands are 90% destroyed up until that point. You can go through these highs and lows where you know she needed rest she needed recovery time she needed extra salt oh the adrenal glands have picked back in 
and you know life kind of resumes normal and you kind of mask those symptoms because I'm able to I was able to function I was able to fight back um so I was pregnant with my daughters um they were you know I went through the pregnancy no problem I went through their labor no problem but they also got a steroid shot. They were six weeks early. I got a steroid shot for them um, before they were born, whether that had any significant play or not in helping me, you know, go through labor um, without going into crisis. I don't know. What I can tell you is I gave birth to two babies naturally in five minutes. So it was a very, for the most part, I got very lucky. Labor was pretty much stress-free. So, um, but when my daughters were six, months old and my son was almost four my dad had surgery um he had addison's disease and he went into a crisis and two weeks after we had to take him off life support when we took my dad off life support i made a comment about how fortunate i was that i no longer grew hair on my legs just like dad he never had hair on his legs um and my sister made a comment you know dad didn't have hair on his legs because of his addison's disease and I didn't know that. So that was kind of the first big red flag when we started to put some pieces of the puzzle together that Jill has no hair on her legs, high salt cravings, you know, maybe we should look into this. And over the progress of those years as well, people really started making comments about my skin tone, that I had beautiful olive skin, um, that they just loved the glow that I had, that little, that, that just, you know, that little bit of hint of a tan. So that little bit hint of a tan that I was de developing over the years was more than likely the ACTH hormone from my brain that was communicating with my adrenal glands to get them to work harder, to make that cortisol, to keep me alive. And what happens with ACTH hormone from your pituitary gland when it goes to abnormal levels, it binds to the exact same receptors in our cells that are responsible for tanning. So it started binding to those cells and giving me, telling my body to tan. Okay. So it was creating the hyperpigmentation. So so now my father's passed away six years after he passed away is when I was diagnosed in those six years. So actually when he passed away, I had some quick blood tests I had my cortisol done, my sodium and my potassium, everything came back normal. Okay. Addison's was ruled out. Jill went on with her life, raising her children. Um, over the course of those six years, more symptoms started to come. My body started telling me there is more things wrong. We are fighting harder in here than what you realize. Um, partly was depression was probably the next thing that started to happen. Um, just being very sad all the time. And, you know, I had a lot going on. I was in a, an emotionally abusive marriage that I didn't realize, you know, what was psychologically happening to me at the time. I had small children. My father had just passed away and I had a first husband that traumatically died. I had a lot on my plate in six years. So, you know what, to me, it made sense. I was depressed. <laughs> Okay. And so I went back to my, my family, to my family doctor and said, look, you know what? Jill's depressed and she doesn't like it. And he gave me a prescription and told me to come back in two weeks and follow up. And when I followed up in two weeks and he asked, well, how do you feel now? I was like, you know, what? I didn't take it. And he was like, well, why didn't you take it? You want to feel better. Take the antidepressant, start to feel better, learn to manage your stress, figure your stuff out. And I'm like, but I'm like, there's just something inside of me that's saying, there's more to this. This is something physical that's causing the depression. And if I mask the depression, I'm scared I'm going to miss the physical. So he was like, okay, do whatever you want. And, and again, I continued, I didn't take any antidepressants. And, and like I said, I had no clue where this was leading, but there was just something inside of me that, that told me there was something more to it. So the other symptoms that I started to develop that really started to put all the pieces of the puzzle together for me were um oddly enough my blood pressure stabilized and I think my blood pressure stabilized because my sodium intake went skyrocketed um I was known that if I would get stressed out I'd put salt in my hand I'd lick the salt um it was salt absolutely on pretty much everything I ate it was a necessity if we went shopping to the mall they everyone knew that you know every three to four hours Jill had to stop and eat something salty. If Jill didn't stop and eat something salty, Jill was miserable. She was agitated. She had no energy, but you feed her salt within, you know, 15, 20 minutes. She felt like a million bucks again. We never put the pieces together of what that was telling us. Um, so I had high sugar cravings as well. I mentioned that earlier, Sunny Delight, Coca-Cola, 
those just got worse. I'd have these dips and I would have to um, take in a very, very high influx of sugar to feel like I had some energy. And from what I have learned now is that cortisol helps move the sugar from my blood into the cells. So if my cortisol was low, I wasn't getting that sugar from my, my blood. But if I kind of surged it, it gave me just a little bit. I was extremely lean, um, leaner than what um, would be normal for my my normal body. Um, I was cold all the time. I get in the tub often. So th these symptoms were probably within the last year when things kind of progressively got worse. Um, I was cold all the time. So I would get in the tub frequently throughout the day to warm up my core temperature. And it was a cold. When I say core temperature, you feel it to your core, um, right straight through my body. Um, just frigid, frigid, extremely cold. Um, I would shake if I would get stressed, I would start to shake, I would tremble um, very quickly. And what I think that was now it was a dip in my cortisol levels really, really fast waiting for those adrenal glands to respond. Um, joint pain, especially when I got out of bed in the morning, had an eye twitch. Um, and then something else that I think I forgot to mention in the high school days. Did I mention it? I can't remember, but I'm going to mention it again <laughs> if I did. So bear with me. Um, cover your ears. This is that sensitive topic. I, I've recorded this episode a couple times. So um, sometimes when I re-record stuff, I can't remember. Was it in the first episode? Was it this episode? Um, I just, I can't remember. So I want to make sure I mentioned it. So in high school, let's backtrack to high school. Because this might be something for important for somebody, and it's very, very personal. But um, there was a very sensitive part of my body, my female anatomy, that when I hit puberty, changed color, and it was my inner labia went extremely dark to the point where it was actually black in color. Um, and at the time, I just kind of chalked that up as puberty. That was my body's changing, um, and that's just the way my body looks as a grown up. Um, years later, fast forward, Jill goes on hydrocortisone. She's 35 now, probably 20 years later, you know, within, you know, probably less than two weeks of being hydrocortisone that returned to a normal skin tone color, the way it's supposed to be. So hyperpigmentation goes into the sensitive parts of your body usually first. So, um, so areas like that, your nail beds, your, your gums, different areas like that pressure points is where you're also going to see that change first. And that's another spot that I noticed that the fall before I was diagnosed, I noticed on my left wrist, I had these little dark dots that I thought were bruises. Um, and I, and I noticed after a few months, they hadn't gone away. And I was a little concerned because I thought they were bruises and they should have cleared up. And the first thing I thought of was, oh my goodness, I have leukemia, like what's going on? There's definitely something extremely seriously wrong with me. I noticed on my right shin that I had a great big patch of darkness from where I had eczema and I would scratch all the time and it got extremely dark and it had slowly grown over time. Um, and there's just different parts of my body that seemed dark scars, different areas like that. Um, so got on Google and did my Google searches and lo and behold, Another symptom of adrenal insufficiency is hyperpigmentation. And I kind of self-diagnosed myself with hyperpigmentation. I also noticed how much I was sleeping. So I go to bed when my children would go to bed around eight o'clock at night. I'd sleep probably about 10 hours, wake up, not rested. And then I would have to nap throughout the day. And then also throughout the day, it was high sugar. It was bathtubs to keep me warm um, and just never, never feeling well. Okay. So went back to my doctor, he feels that, you know, it had been a short period of time since we had done the initial blood test that nothing probably really has changed. Um, so I proceeded to show him the mark on my shin. I'm like, but look at this. And he was like, that is hyperpigmentation and your adrenal glands are failing. You have Addison's disease. It was, he knew instantly what that hyperpigmentation meant. Um, the marks that I had on my wrist were actually pressure points for my watch pushing into my wrist all the time caused the hyperpigmentation to go there first. So it's going to get concentrated in these spots, the sensitive spots of your body, pressure points, and then it's going to go all through your body. And at this point, so this would have been in like, I think this was in January of 2011, um, I had these darker spots, but my entire body was actually tanned as well. So 
Um, I had super dark spots, but I also had a beautiful, glowing, wonderful tan in January in Canada. So we quickly did some blood tests. And this is a very important part, I think, of my journey with adrenal insufficiency is, you know, he did the cortisol, the sodium, and potassium. Those are the trademark blood tests that family doctors have been trained to test for adrenal insufficiency. If those are off, you test for Addison's disease. Um, my blood test, again, came back normal. Okay. Again, these adrenal glands are amazing. They were fighting so hard for me. They could make me look normal on paper. Okay, they can make my blood still be a normal functioning levels and keep me alive. But my family doctor being as brilliant as he is also tested my ACTH levels, which is responsible for the hyperpigmentation um, that came back. That's supposed to be at the time the reference values in Canada was 10 or less. Mine came back in the 300s. I requested that we test it again at nine days later within nine days. I think it was into the 600s. So I was very quickly failing, but my cortisol, sodium, potassium were still normal because my brain was still able to get those adrenal glands to function enough to do that. Okay. So I quickly got into a, an endocrinologist, had an ACTH stimulation test, which is when they take a synthetic form of that hormone from your brain and they gave me an IV, they injected it into me and they took blood values at certain intervals to measure if my adrenal glands responded. Jill's adrenal glands did not respond. I was told I no longer had any extra re reserves left in my adrenal glands. And if I would have gotten ill that winter or had an injury, odds are I probably would have died before they figured out that I was having problems with my adrenal glands. And then Jill went on to hydrocortisone and her journey with adrenal insufficiency began. So one thing I mentioned at the beginning is I wanted to mention how I feel when people um, tell me that they know how it, they, they feel, oh, you have issues with cortisol. I, I know what that's like because, you know, I, I have adrenal fatigue. Um, you know, that's, you know, somebody with Addison's disease, adrenal insufficiency in general, whether it's primary or secondary, because we're all treated and maintained in the same. Um, trust me, you, if you have adrenal fatigue, um, that's personally what I know of it is, is something I just personally don't believe in. Um, because I know what it feels like to have low cortisol and have cortisol issues. And I can promise you it is nothing in comparison to how you, you're feeling. Um, my personal opinion is people with adrenal fatigue is it's more lifestyle management. You're overstressed, you're overworked, you're abusing your body in ways. And it's telling you through other symptoms and the way you feel that you're doing too much and you need to manage your lifestyle better. Um, you need to de-stress, you need to, you know, whatever it is. Okay. You know, if your cortisol is a little bit too high or, you know, if your cortisol is too high, there, there's a disease called Cushing's. That's a completely different issue. Um, and if you're having cortisol issues because you're going through a diagnosis and you think you might have um, adrenal insufficiency, that's a different issue as well. You need to look into all the symptoms and fight for an adrenal insufficiency issue. If it's just lifestyle skills, start managing your life better and start eliminating alleviating those symptoms and how you're feeling that drained feeling that you feel. But I can tell you that drained feeling has nothing in comparison of what it feels like when your body's fighting Addison's disease or adrenal insufficiency. So thank you again for tuning in. I hope this provided a little bit of insight, especially for those who are going through a diagnosis and please keep in mind, if you are getting blood readings, blood cortisol, sodium, potassium readings that are still saying that, you know, that are saying that they're normal, that there's no issues with your adrenal insufficiency, look into that ACTH stimulation test, um, look into an ACTH blood test, start there. Um, and do not rule out Addison's disease, trust your instincts and fight for your diagnosis. So thank you for listening. And until next time, please be well, my pickles.